new to Julia, it makes sense to you. Um, and I think it gets to the heart of what makes Julia special and one of the reasons that we see a huge amount of code reuse uh, throughout the ecosystem, a sort of really surprising amount of code reuse that you know, we were promised by object-oriented programming languages for you know, many decades and haven't, it hasn't really materialized in the way that we hoped. Um, but we are actually seeing that kind of code reuse and sharing happen in Julia. Um, and frankly, we're like cre people who created the language, we're also surprised. We're like, hey, why is this happening? Um, so this is my attempt to sort of explain that to you. And I think in the process, hopefully, really get at the heart of like what makes Julia, Julia. Um, and so, you know, the first question is, what, what is this multiple dispatch thing that I'm going to be talking about? Um, well, so this little table sort of explains some things about it. So, you know, terminology is, you know, degree of dispatch. And, you know, that talks about how many different versions, when you see a function call, how many versions of that thing, f, could you possibly be calling? Um, and so, you know, back in, the, back in the early days of higher level programming languages, you had people in, got this notion of functions, but you know, that, that enough was enough of an innovation. There was no dispatch. It was just, you know, f, you know, refers to some pointer somewhere that implements some functionality. It takes some arguments, it does some stuff, it returns. Um, this was a big improvement on the sort of spaghetti code go-to type of thing that people did in machine code before that. So it made, made code much easier to understand and reason about. Um, but there's no, there's no dispatch. The, what f means doesn't depend on any of the arguments. It just is what it is. Um, and uh, this column selection power I'll talk about a little bit about later, but essentially what it's about is, you know, how many different pieces of code could possibly be selected based on just this one thing that you see, seeing f of, f of x comma y. And the answer for, for <laughs> no dispatch is that there's only one thing. It's order, of one, order one. Um, now, you know, there was this big change in, you know, a lot of, uh, and a lot of hype around it, a lot of talk, a lot of, you know, a lot of programming languages these days that you use. If you've used Python, C++, Java, um, many programming languages, they are single dispatch, object-oriented languages. And so, you know, their major innovation was they changed the syntax. Uh, no, no, that's actually not the major innovation. But as a side effect, they changed the syntax because what happened is, Someone came along and said, you know, hey, it's really useful sometimes to be able to have different versions of this f function. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make one of the arguments special, and we're going to pick which version of f we call based on that, ver that function, that, uh, the type of that argument. And so to indicate that it was special, people wrote the x in front. So they wrote x dot f of y. And so now, based on the value of x, you pick which version of f you're going to call. Uh, why doesn't matter. It's just an argument. It's just a normal argument, like in, in the other in the olden days. Um, so now this increases our selection power by a drastic amount. You can see why people were excited about this. They went from zero or no selection whatsoever to one, some selection, right? So the notation here, I said, uh, I you know bars around capital X. So let's say capital X is the type of X. This is what is the size of the type of X, and and this is sort of a weird notion, it's actually how many concrete types exist, right? That's actually what we're basing the selection on. So if x is some abstract type, um, how many concrete types could x possibly take? Um, that's the selection power. So now multiple dispatch is basically just taking that idea and saying, well, you know, what's so special about x? What if I wanted to call a special version based on the other argument, too? Or maybe if there are three arguments, I want to call a special version based on some, some combination of those three arguments. Um, so now we're dispatching on all of the arguments. And if there were more arguments, they'd all be in there. Um, and so now the select power becomes this product. So it's, you know, the, it's potentially you're, you're selecting different code based on you know, how many concrete types x and y could possibly take on. And now in, in practice, you don't generally specialize on every single possible combination, because that would be an, you know, it's an exponential explosion. But, you know, but sometimes it's really handy to be able to patch into one of these things. So you know, OK, that seems like okay, cool, nice generalization. How useful really is it? Um, what, one of the other things is that we go back to the traditional function call syntax, because x isn't special anymore. And this is actually one of the first stumbling blocks people coming from OO languages have. You know, multiple dispatch is not all, you know, sunshine and puppies. Uh, people really like this dot notation. And one of the nice things about it is that it's often, you know, subject, verb, object. 
and that reads very naturally and for people coming from a lot of languages. You can also chain it from left to right. Um, it has a nice property about namespacing of f, so if you have totally unrelated x things and they have the same function name f, it doesn't matter, it's not a problem. Um, so we lose those nice things, but hopefully I'm going to convince you that we have a lot of benefits that are more than compensated for that. Okay, so a demo, for those of you who have never seen a multiple dispatch in action, is probably the most effective thing I could do to show this. Right. Sorry, why, why can't you have all of them, like, have the, uh, the documentation and the different types of arguments to a uh, function? So you could, and we've sort of thought about different ways to do that, but it just sort of, it loses a bit of purity, right? One of the nice things about it is that it doesn't matter. Like, you dispatch on everything, so why write one of them specially when it's not special? So you could have the syntax, but it doesn't really mesh with the way the function, the language actually works. Um, so here's, here's the way basic dispatch works. So you can define some methods on things. So this is kind of the key, the key innovation is that you can say, you can put this colon colon annotation on, the t on an argument to specify that it has to be of this type. And what that means is that you will select um, the method based on the, it's the most specific method that applies to the actual types of the arguments that you get. So here we have, so writing A by itself and writing colon colon any mean the same thing. They mean it's unconstrained. Um, this defines, this defines a two argument fallback for this F function. Um, and then we say, oh, well, if F and A, A and B are both numbers, then we're going to return the string A and B are both numbers. Um, if A is a number but B isn't, then We'll just say A is a number, same thing with B, but, and then if they're integers, we'll say something more specific. And we can just define this, um, takes a second, and then you can see that it returns this F object, which is called a generic function with five methods. So when you do multiple dispatch, there's this, the function object, the methods belong to the function object. So this is unlike single dispatch where the methods belong to the type of X. In, 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 th in this case, that doesn't make sense because the methods don't just apply to x, they apply to a whole signature. They belong to this thing called a, a generic function, and that's what, sort of a collection of methods. Um, and so here we have f, which is a generic function, which has five methods. And we can, we can see them by saying methods of f. Um, and in fact, these are printed not in some arbitrary order, but in a very specific order. Oh, that does not do good for the formatting. Hopefully people can read this. So they're actually printed from most specific to least specific, which is not a total ordering, but this is some ordering of that. And in fact, you can think about dispatch as just going from the top to the bottom and picking the first thing that applies. That's the order that they're printed in. So let's say we call f of 1.5 comma 2. So we look at the first method and we say, OK, uh, integer, integer. Well, a isn't an integer. It's a floating point number, so that doesn't apply. We go to the second method and we see number, number. OK, well, they're both numbers, so this applies, so we call it. And indeed, we call that method and we see A and B are both numbers. Now, if we call uh, you know, F of 1 and the string bar, then we see, OK, well, the, the process was exactly the same. We look at the first one. Well, they're not both integers because B is not a, an integer. They're not both numbers because B is a string, which is not a number. We get to the third method and we see, ah, okay, A is a number, B is a string, we can call this one. So we call it. Um, now if we call it with two integers, we just look at the first one and it gets called because of both integers. So we see that. Okay. So this is not the same order we define them in, but this is the order that really matters. Um, and the order, order definition for methods does not matter. You can reorder them however you want and the same thing will happen. Um, so here are some things. This calls the fallback because it is a string and an array. So we don't have anything special for that, but we do have this fallback method that just returns fallback. So that applies to anything. We didn't define any fallback from more, for other than two arguments. So this will be a method error. OK, so far so good. This is the basics. If you're following along with me so far, this is actually all you need to know for the rest of the talk. Um, I'll do a little bit more just for, for you know, safe, you know, the safe, safe sake of you know, clarity and completeness. Um, so you know, 
someone who's following along may be like, well, what happens if there's uh, an ambiguity? So let's define an ambiguous case. So g of a int and b number, and g of a number and b int. So one of them returns one, one of them returns two. OK. So, so far so good. This is easy. But what happened here? Any guesses? First one. How, why? Uh, because you passed the primitive now, the primitive type first on the second method. OK, so that is the way a lot of multiple dispatch languages, like research languages, were defined, that they prefer the first argument. So we made the decision that we do what's called symmetric, symmetric multiple dispatch, which means that none of the arguments are special. So that is how a lot of like research languages who've done this have, would have done it. But instead, what we do is it's ambiguous. So it's an error. So what you have to do, and it suggests, it says, you know, uh, you know, it gives you the two possible options, and then it says possible fix define g int int. Um, so we define that int int on a 64-bit machine. Int is an alias for 60 int 64. So we define it to return 1.5, we split the difference. Um, and so now we see that that is no longer an error. We get 1.5. OK. Why is it possible fix? Why is it what? Why, why is it possible fix? Would, that, would, the, would the possible fix suggest that we fix it? Or? I mean, I think so. I think, <laughs> I think we, we get this intersection correct. Um, I, maybe you want to do something else. I don't know. always <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the possible well, fix will always fix it. This gives you the exact signature of the ambiguous intersection. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you define that, that'll fix the, the specific problem that you ran into. But there may be other ones, so there may be a more general fix you want to do. Um, there are even more fancy types of dispatch in Julia. Um, there are things, there's something called diagonal dispatch, where you require that the concrete types of multiple arguments match. Um, I'm not going to get into this because I need to get on with the talk, but it's uh, it's it's very powerful and useful for mathematical programming. You can do various things with multiple arguments, optional arguments, keyword arguments, you know, the whole shebang, all all of the things you might want to do with uh, with dispatch and 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 arguments. Okay, so let's get back to the talk. Okay, so if you're familiar with Julia's ecosystem, you may have noticed this thing that happens. There's a really, really large amount of code sharing and code reuse. And I mean, as compared to other comparable, like high level languages that you know are often dynamic, those are usually the high level, easy to use ones, and they're already a pretty happy to share crowd. So the fact that it's notably more is really, you know, is 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 worth paying attention to and wondering about. Um, this is if you haven't tried Julia, you know maybe you don't believe me. You can you'll you'll see you can judge for yourself, but you know you'll have to take my word for it for now. But uh, you know we were puzzled by this. This is a genuine surprise. Uh, we did not predict most of this. There's sort of part of it that we kind of intended, but part of it was really genuinely a surprise. Um, and we I, we think it's due to multiple dispatch. That's the explanation. That's the case I'm going to make in the rest of the talk. Um, but we chose multiple dispatch pretty much because it was really natural for mathematics, right? When you write x dot plus y, what that means depends on the type of x and the type of y. It doesn't really make sense for, to say that it only belongs to x, that, math, that operation. Um, it's also really nice for expressing generic algorithms. And that's actually the part that we intended. And that's the second half of the talk. But the first half of the talk is sort of the part that came out of nowhere. Um, so there's two kinds of code re reuse. And those are the two parts of the talk. So the first one is that there are a lot of common types that are you know, very simple definitions that are then shared by a lot of different packages throughout the ecosystem. Um, and this is the part that you're like, why isn't this happening elsewhere? Why do, why do we see so much of this here when object-oriented languages were supposed to do this really well and don't seem to be doing it? Um, and the other side is generic algorithms. We see those applied to many different types. And, they just, and code. Code that's generic is just supposed like you know it's supposed to just work, but you know famous last words, and then you know you're arguing with a compiler and trying to do double dispatch, and you know months later you're like ah I give up I'm just going to copy the code and do a specialized implementation. Um, in Julia, this, the generic algorithms just kind of work. Um, so you know why is that? So we we believe that there are different explanations for these two things, but they both stem from from same same basic multiple dispatch paradigm. 
OK, so the first, the first aspect of this is sharing common types. So I'm just going to set a, a basic example here is let's suppose you have an RGB type, very simple. Um, there's one in, there's a package called color types, which defines a bunch of different color types, including an RGB type. I'm going to think about an even simplified version of this, where all it is, is it, let's say it has no type parameters. It's just an RGB field, and they're all float 64. Um, you know, that is among the types that can be defined in color types, but that's sort of a specialized version that we're going to focus in on. Um, it comes with some basic operations uh, that the author of the package thought made sense, but, you know, they're sort of, it's, it's what they thought made sense and not, any, not really a huge amount of stuff. So now you come along and you're like, well, you know what? I have this cool idea. I want to turn, um, we're, we're going to use the example of turning are the RGB type into a vector space. So, you know, you can add the components. This is technically, if you look at this uh, color spaces package, um, it, it says that technically, you know, RGB isn't really a linear color space. It's nonlinear, and you're supposed to convert to the XYZ color space and then do the linear thing and then convert back. So this is technically wrong, but it's pretty close. Um, and then this, this visualization shows you how far off it actually is. Uh, and then it goes on to implement a bunch of stuff. Uh, so basically, it starts with the color types package. So it starts with colors, which is an older version of the color types package and then adds a bunch of operations, including plus and times and with a scalar and all this other stuff. And I, I've, I've distilled this down a little bit for you so that we don't have to dig so deep into it. Uh, where is my keynote? Oh, yeah. There, OK. Um, so you want to add some operations to this basic type. OK, so in Julia, how does this work? It's very simple. Uh, you just add methods. That's it. There's no, nothing complicated. There's no ifs, and, or buts about it. You just you say, you know, I want to have a zero method. So the, there's, the, the base language defines this thing called zero. It's a function that takes some kind of thing and gives you the zero element for that kind of thing. Um, so to define zero for RGB, so that type thing just means when you pass the actual value RGB, this is what I want you to give you. And it just calls RGB 0, 0, 0. That's the 0 of the vector space. Um, but then you can also define new, new operations. So they find this uh, color, color dot product, dot, which you know dot C for short. Um, and it just takes it has a bunch of other definitions. But in particular, if you, if you want to take the R dot product of two RGB vectors, so you're considering the vectors now. This is how you compute it, and the, uh, the coefficients are just from squaring the conversion to grayscale and normalizing. I don't know what that means, but that's what it says. It makes some sort of sense. Um, the re key point is that it's super simple. You just do this, and now you can call .c on RGB types, and you can call zero on RGB types. Any co existing code that calls zero on something, if you pass it an RGB, it'll work. Just will do the thing that it's supposed to do. OK, so what's the big deal? This seems super straightforward and like totally unremarkable. Um, isn't this, is this really harder in other languages? And the answer is surprisingly yes. It is especially very hard in class-based, object-oriented languages, which I'm going to call CBOO for short. Um, and so C in CBO languages, the key is that methods go inside of classes. So you define a class, and then you inside the class, you define a bunch of methods for that class. Um, and that seems to make sense because they belong with the class, right? That's, there's no generic function that they're attached to. They're just attached to the type that you're defining. So to add methods to the class, you have two choices. One, you edit the text of the original class. So you add stuff in this one single place where the, thing, where the RGB type is defined. Or two, you inherit. There's this fun thing called inheritance, which is actually quite useful. Um, you inherit from the RGB type and add methods to in your inherited type. So we're going to look at both these options and see why they're kind of a problem. OK, so adding every method that anybody ever wants to add to the RGB type is problematic. So first of all, you have to convince the author to do this. So they may not think it's a good idea. They may be like, I have a nice, clean RGB type, and I don't want your junk in it, so go away. Um, and, and you know, they're not wrong, right? They have to maintain your code. So you know, maybe you'll help, maybe you won't. Now they have all of your stuff that they have to deal with. Um, 
if everyone wants to do this, and you know, if you're if the RGB type is really popular, then everyone will want to do this. There will be tons of people who want to extend it in various ways. Now the class becomes huge. So now we start to see why the author was a little bit reluctant. They're like, oh man, now there's like ten, you know, tens of thousands of lines of code that I didn't write that I have to deal with. This is a problem. Um, now let's say you, you know, so the, for example, the color vector spaces idea seems to be an abandoned experiment. So Tim Holy wrote this. He thought it was a good idea at the time. Later on, he was like, eh, this isn't a, I don't, I don't actually care about this. Nobody seems to want it. So he just abandons the color spaces, color vector spaces package, and nobody who was, and anybody who wasn't using it, they're totally unaffected. If you had put the code into the RGB class, now we have no idea who's using it because it's in the original RGB type, so we have to keep it around because anybody who's using RGB could potentially be using this code. So we can't delete it. Whereas if it's in a separate package, then you know anybody who's not using the package is not depending on this code, so we can, we're fine. Okay, so the other option is inheriting from the RGB class. So this is sort of the like classic, you know, object-oriented programming, this is how you should do it answer. Um, so one annoyance, this is minor, but you know, it needs a new name. So now, all, I'm not adding any data, but all I'm saying is like, oh, well, I, I need to add some methods to this RGB thing, but now I can't call it RGB anymore. I have to call it my RGB. All right, whatever, I'm gonna call it my RGB. No, fine, fine, that's slightly annoying, but sure. Um, okay, but there's a more substantial problem, which is now, so let's suppose there's some code I don't really control that constructs RGB objects some sort of RGB object factory. Um, and then I want to call my methods on it. I can't. Like, RGB is not a subtype of my RGB. My RGB is a subtype of RGB. So now we're just stuck. So what do we do? OK, the classic solution here is that we convince the person who generates those RGB objects. Like, actually, you don't want to generate RGB objects. You want to ge generate a a selectable type of RGB object, and you need to provide an API for me to tell you which type of R which subtype of R object RGB object to generate. This kind of pattern is called inversion of control or dependency injection in object-oriented languages, and it is annoying. Like nobody wants to do this. Um, it, it you know convincing someone to do this is is one thing, and then you know the the code becomes way more complex because you had to do it. Um, be really nice if we just didn't have to. Uh, now, suppose there are multiple extensions. So, you know, the idea is RGB is wildly popular and there's tons of people who want to extend it in different ways. So now you have my RGB and your RGB. If you want to use those together at the same time, you have to subtype both of them into a new thing that is a, using multiple inheritance called our, uh, our RGB. I didn't pronounce that before. <laughs> thinking about how it sounds. Our RGB is very hard to say. Uh, it has to inherit from both in order to use them together. And that is assuming your language can even do that. There's a lot of object-oriented languages that don't support multiple inheritance. Yeah. You get into a similar situation if you use two packages that define addition of RGBs. Yes, that's true. So if you had two, two packages that defined addition of RGBs, um, they could have a, cl cl a colliding definition. So that's why that's considered type piracy in Julia. So if you don't, if you're not the person, the package defining RGB and you're not the package defining plus operator, then it's not considered, you're, you can do it. We're not gonna stop you technically, but you, it's considered to be what's called, I didn't come up with the name. We're not sure where it originated, but type piracy is a great term. Um, you know, you're, you're pirating, the method you're, you're you're you know breaking the law by defining this method that you don't own the the you know if you don't own the function or the arg or one of the argument types then you know you're technically not supposed to do that so that's does that address the issue i mean yeah but then the argument that multiple dispatch solves the multiple <coughs> problem depends on type types it doesn't so i mean that is one of the cases where if there should be like a, an addition method for RGB, I would argue that that should go into the base RGB package. It, in order for it not to be type piracy, it must go into the base RGB package. Um, but there's a limited amount of that stuff, right? Like 
you know, you you can make this a case that like should add define addition on RGB elements, but you know, if you want to have a totally new function, like um, and in and the zero function, right? If you can, you could make the argument that the zero function for RGB should be defined in the RGB package, um, and it really can't. It can't cr like technically correctly go anywhere else because if someone else adds it, they can, and it's fine. It's actually kind of nice that you can do that. But also, what else would it be defined as? So even if there's two mul two different definitions of it, they're going to agree probably. Um, but you know this other thing, this dot c thing, the the color dot product, um, you know that's namespaced inside of the color vector spaces package. It has it won't affect anybody else. Um, okay. So in class based object oriented programming, we have two two have to choose between two fairly lousy options. Um, but there's actually two more options. Uh, so one is just give up on dispatch. Be like forget this dispatch thing, I'm just going to define functions externally and go back to writing f of x comma y. Um, it, it's a win because f can be defined outside of the class in a separate code base. But it's a problem because it gives up all code selection power, which re 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 ruins the other kind of reuse that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so this is like a solution that's worse than, you know, the, the cure is worse than the, than the illness. Um, and the other one is give up on code sharing. So just make your own copy of RGB because you know it's a pretty simple type. And this is, in, in fact, I think what we see in the most in most class-based object-oriented languages. You'll see like a lot of like a lot of different Python packages will have their own like re-implementation of some simple concept because you know it's just easier to do it that way than to try to share. Okay, so this is pretty much the case for why multiple dispatch is good for sharing common types. And this is the part that we didn't we didn't really foresee. It's also interesting to notice that it, like at no point did multiple arguments come in here. The whole thing this is like only powerful because of external dispatch. So essentially, what it is is that it's the the key thing is you can define methods on types after the type is defined. This is a pretty simple thing that could be added to class based languages if there if it was done in a sort of this way, the real problem, there's an additional subtlety, which is that generic functions are properly namespaced, whereas method names in ob object-oriented programming languages are just all in a single shared global namespace. So if I had a C dot C function and you had a dot C function um, in Julia, that's not a problem. Or here, here the example is foo. If they're separate functions, it's not a problem. We don't have to agree because they're just separate objects, whereas that doesn't work in class-based languages. So they have that problem as well. Um, but we have the problem with type piracy. But I think that's a strictly less prob difficult problem than the, than the, um, the just not having namespacing at all. OK, so the, the other type of code sharing is, is just writing generic code and having it just work. Um, so I tried to come up with an example. It's so hard to come up with a killer example of this, but this was my best ap attempt. <laughs> so it's a little bit of linear, simple linear algebra. So the function takes something a, which you know we could put type annotations here, but I'm not going to bother. Uh, it's going to be some kind of matrix. Uh, v s is like a collection of vectors, um, and then what we do is we start with t, which is going to be the zero uh, of the the zero value of the element type of a. So in our examples, this is just going to be you know zero point zero floating point. And then we're going to look at for each vector in Vs. We're going to iterate through all of them. And then we're going to compute this inner product uh, of V with a generic inner product can go through a matrix. So we're going to have V with A and then with V itself. And so this, and when we provide a generic definition of this, which is that the inner product of A, V, A, and V is just the dot product of V with A times V. So there's a couple different ways to write that. You could also write it as the dot product of V transpose A with V. Um, they're equivalent. They'll compute the same thing. Um, oh, actually, this, this should be written with different argument names. This will actually be wrong if I try to whoops, write this. OK, so let's play with some code. All right. Okay. I'm going to start with a new session. Hopefully, this is big enough for people to see. Okay, so function f, I have this in my history. 
This is how it's defined. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to define inner. And you have, I see I have the correct definition in my history. Um, if you if you com if you do have two arguments with the same name, it'll complain that you have two arguments with the same name. So uh, the version in the slide won't work. Okay, so let's just define some random three by three matrix A, and then define. That's a later definition, but let's just define this as random. Okay, so. This is a, an array comprehension that produces ten, a 10. Um, I'm going to need a 4 in there. It's going to produce 10 three-element vectors. Maybe I can make this small enough that those are visible. Yeah, there we go. That's a good size. OK, so there's 10. So we have my A, a is 3 by 3 matrix. Um, so what, what the code is going to do is it's going to go through each of these three by three each of these three element vectors and then take the inner product through A uh, of that vector with itself and then add up the, that's going to be a scalar and then it's going to add up all of those scalars. This is probably a totally meaningless operation, um, but it's like vaguely plausible as something people would write in generic code. Okay, so problem is dot not defined. Um, it comes from the linear algebra package. OK, so now, cool. That's some meaningless number that we computed, but it appears to be doing what we want to do. Um, I'm going to, this is, we have a lot of code introspection in Julia. Don't be too scared about this, but I just kind of want to get a sense of what this thing is doing. Um, so code info shows you what, or this code type shows you sort of the type inferred version of your code. And we can see that it's looking up some stuff in an array. It's calling the inner product function. It's doing some dispatch. I don't know. Whatever. It's doing some stuff. Um, okay. So that's 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 basically what this does. I think you know that's enough to get the sense of it. We can go back to the presentation now. All right. Um, uh, one pro tip here to write highly generic code: just leave off all types. Just don't mention any types, and it's totally generic. Um, I'm like only half kidding. Um, all right, so let's go, let's go a step further. This is you know fine. It works on built-in types. Um, oh, one of the things I did want to show. Uh, we can do things like static arrays. So using there's this great static arrays package. Um, okay, so. So we can just make A a static matrix, and now it puts the actual dimensions of the matrix in the type, and now everything gets super specialized on the exact fact, fact that this is 3 by 3. And we can do the same thing with the Vs. We can say that this is going to be a... This is going to be a vector of, these, of three vectors, and now we call the exact same code. We don't change anything. Um, and it computes a different value because I generated new random values, but it's doing the same thing. Um, but if we look at the code typed, uh, it looks different. It's actually longer, but it's actually doing much more efficient stuff. Let's see if I can do code native. This is sort of the ultimate like test of what it, how much it's doing. You can see that it's just doing a bunch of vector instructions and nothing else. So this is what you know, super fast vector vector matrix code looks like. Um, so you know, the, the the basic moral of the story here is that you know, for just by writing some very generic code that didn't do anything special with types, didn't even mention them, you just get the benefit of this works with all of this like crazy stuff in the Julia ecosystem. So you know, the built-in array types and vector types. But if you want to get get really crazy and and optimize the ha heck out of this. All you need to do is just change the arguments that you pass into these static array types, and then, like, boom, you get like super fast code. All right. Um, so let's let's go a step further, and let, let's not just do something that you know someone else defined. Let's define our own new type. It's really simple. Um, 
And it's actually, it's, so it's, it's actually common, really commonly used in machine learning, and it is a one-hot vector. Um, the basic idea is that it's a vector where only one of the values is one and everything else is zero. So, you know, sure, we could store a bunch of zeros in a single one, but that's way inefficient. We don't, all we need to do is store which index the one, we, the one is at. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to find a type that represents it that way. Um, this is the entire type definition and all of its methods. So you can see, like, very, very concise uh, generic implementation of something. So this, uh, we, we import from size and get index and star, because those are the things we're going to define methods for. Actually, not even star yet. We'll get to that later. Um, so it's a structure. So it has some fields. It's called one hot vector. It subtypes abstract vector uh, with element type Boolean. Um, and that this the subtyping abstract vector is what makes all of the magic work. That's the thing that just gives you all of this generic definitions. And all you need to do is define a couple of really simple things. So in this case, we're just going to define the size of the thing, which is just a tuple, which is the length. It's a one tuple of the length. That's it, the size. And then how to get something. The most basic thing is like, well, what's, what's that a particular index in a vector? That's the thing I need to know from a vector. So it, you, you, the arguments are one hot vector and the integer index. Um, and the answer is going to be a Boolean. It's just, is i equal to v dot index? So this thing knows its length, um, and it knows the index that is 1. And those are the only two things it knows. This, so this, is, this is the whole implementation. Um, and again, we're going to take a look at the code. All right. Uh, So somewhere in here is the definition. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. Okay. So now the question is, can we already just use this thing? Um, so I'm going to keep A the same as before. And just for you know kicks, I'm going to leave it as an S array because you know these types know nothing about each other, but it should just work. Uh, I didn't actually try this, so we'll see. Uh, I'm fairly confident. Um, so we can't just put random numbers in a one-hot vector, but what we can do is we can say one-hot vector, they're all going to be length 3, but we're just going to pick a random index between 1 and 3 to be the, the one index. So now, OK, so there we have some random one-hot vectors. Um, and you know the implementation of one of these things, so VS1, we can look at it, and we can see that it is actually can call the dump function on the dump. Yeah. You can call the dump function on it. You can see the structure is actually this lane three and the index two. Um, you know that corresponds to the one being in the middle. So it prints in the way we want a vector to print, but it's actually represented in this very compact way. And of course, if this was a huge vector instead of a L three element vector, then this would be a much bigger savings. Um, but it would not fit on my screen. OK, so now we're just going to call VA, uh, you know, A of VS, and boom, same thing, just works. Uh, the implementation is totally different, though. Uh, and how is this working? Well, it's, you know, it's going in and it's calling. If we look at the code, it's going in and. It's calling inner on our one hot vector uh, with you know a one hot vector and a static array and a one hot vector, which then calls is defined below. So it calls uh, it calls the dot function, um, and then it calls a times v. Well, okay. So how does on any of this work? Well, the the thing is, there's a generic definition of mul matrix multiply that all it needs is the size of the thing and how to get something at a certain index, and that's all it needs to implement this. But it's not very efficient because it has to go through and like, you know, look at things and okay, well, can, maybe we can do some better. Okay, so so we're zooming in on the inner function and you know, okay, so a times v calls the generic matrix multiplication. It iterates through the columns of a and multiplies them by each entry of v. So that means we're looking at each entry and being like, oh, is it is it what is the value? Oh, it's a zero. Oh, it's a zero. Oh, it's a zero. Oh, this one's a one. Oh, it's a zero. Oh, it's a zero. Oh, it's a zero. We could do much better. 
And it also returns a column, a copy of the column of A. So that's also something we're going to fix. But then dot V comma A times V calls a generic dot implementation, which just goes through and does in indexing. But we can do much better for both of these things. So first of all, um, A times V. So optimizing this is super simple. You just want to define the right method for the times function. And the method we want, all it's doing is selecting a column, right? That's the whole point of the one hot vector is that it, so it selects a column. So we can just define the, the matvec operation um, to select the correct index. So now this is much more efficient than scanning through every single index and being like, what's your value? Are you a 0? Are you a 0? Are you a 0? Um, we just do this directly. So the other thing we can do, we can take a look at that matvec vec oper operation uh, optimized. I'm not going to switch back to the terminal. Just believe me that it's faster and more efficient. Um, the other thing we can optimize is we can optimize the inner product. So the inner product was defined in terms of this matvec, but the inner product operation, all this is actually doing is pulling out a single value in the array. Because if you got a one hot vector and a one hot vector, you're pulling out the the value that's at that index and this index. So we just define this method, inner, with a one hot vector, and then whatever a is, and then w is also a one hot vector, and we pick the, we index into a at v in dot in and w dot in. So now we've optimized away any copy or creation of intermediate vectors. All we're doing is pulling a scalar out of, out of an array. This is about as efficient as it gets. Well, just believe me, it's faster. Um, I, I feel like showing people like machine code to prove that it's faster is going a little over the top. Um, okay, so we use multiple dispatch here for speed. Um, you know, there, there already existed definitions, but they were slower than optimal, but they were correct. They did the right thing. Um, we, use, we use the generic multiply provided by Julia, and we, we defined a generic inner product for ourselves in terms of dot product and, and matvec. Um, so this, this is a lot of the cases where you really want to use multiple dispatch. Um, but there's also cases where there just is no generic implementation. The system has no idea how to do a thing. So then you'll get a method error, and you, you solve the problem the exact same way. So it's the same as identifying that this thing could be faster, and I'm just going to define a specialized method for it. You just define a method for the thing that's missing, and then it'll, it'll work. Um, so now the comparison. So how, what happens in a single dispatch language? So it's possible, but there are some problems. So how, like this first thing we did, we, we wanted to multiply, at, define a, a matvec operation. Well, so the first problem is you need to dispatch on the second argument, not the first. So if we wanted to dispatch on the first argument, then bam, we're golden, totally what these languages are designed to do. If you want to dispatch on the second argument, this is not what they're designed to do. They don't do that. So there's this trick called double dispatch, which basically means that you define a really generic version method for the first argument that then calls a reversed version of itself on the second argument, which then gets to do the dispatch again. Um, and so you know, let's, for the sake of argument, call it underscore, underscore, armal, underscore, underscore. So that's actually what it's called in Python, and this is a standard pattern, and it's actually built in for you. But it's only built in for plus and times. So if you're doing your own operation, then you're out of luck. Um, it's also, you know, the situations in which armol gets called, called. Like I looked at the Stack Overflow answer for that, and it's a little bit disturbing. Um, it's it's m more complicated than I'm making it out to be here. Uh, in C++ and other languages, you can do this, but you have to roll your own. Um, the pattern is called double dis double dispatch. Um, related patterns are like a visitor pattern and all these things. So you know we don't have these patterns in Julia because you're like, well, just define a method. Like you're done. End of story. Um, the other one, okay. So now the inner product one. Ugh, okay. Uh, now you have to dispatch on the first and third arguments, not the second one. Maybe the second one if you wanted to do some other specialization. Unclear how to do this in a single dispatch language. Triple dispatch, I've never seen or heard of that. It seems crazy. Nobody does it. Um, there's no real good solution here in single dispatch languages. So you're just kind of out of luck. Um, uh, so what about method overloading? This always comes up. So you know, 
this looks a lot like you can write a signature that looks like this in C++, Java, C Sharp, whatever. Why does that not solve the problem? And the answer is uh, that method doesn't get called when the caller is generic. So if you're writing a generic algorithm, that means that you know the type of V and W in the generic context is something like abstract vector. I don't know what type it is. I don't care. I just want to do this algorithm for abstract vectors in general. But with method overloading, the way you pick the, the method you're calling, it's based on the static type of the things. And so this method will not get called, because the, it, it will only get called if the concrete static type is one hot vector. So yes, in code that, said, that knows that V and W are one hot vectors, you can call this method. But in code that doesn't know specifically that V and W are one hot vectors, this will not get called. It doesn't solve your problem. So it actually, like, it's convenient for non-generic code, but it does nothing for you for generic code. So it's it's like a, it's a weird feature that like looks like it solves the problem, but actually does fails you exactly when you need it. Um, so it's nice, but it doesn't actually help. So back to this diagram. Uh, maybe people understand a little bit more what selection power means here. It's really just you know, for for O of one code. How many possible implementations could that O of one code actually be calling? Um, and with no dispatch, it's just, you know, what you see is what you get. With a little bit of dispatch, it's linear. And then multiple dispatch, it's, you know, proportional to the, the possible selection of each of the arguments. And therefore, it's, sort of, it's this exponential increase in power. Um, so how real is this problem? So this is, this is a really hard problem to make. It's very easy to look at all this and be like, oh, well, you know, nobody actually cares about this. It doesn't matter. These, dis these single dispatch languages are doing just fine. Thank you very much. Um, so, so I mean, the argument, it's hard to make this argument. Um, you know, there's people who are in, use Julia all the time and are like, oh, yeah, this is, this is like totally true. There's other people who are going to be major skeptics. Um, we see generic code like this all the time in Julia. Anecdotally, it just works. Um, the biggest problem usually is that people have overtyped their code and they've written a function that would work on any type of vector, but they've written, you know, they've specifically written it for like a dense vector of float 64s. And it's well, actually, it doesn't care what a, the element type is and it doesn't care what the how the vector is implemented. So it could have just been anything. So usually what happens is one person comes along, they discover it doesn't work, they complain. Um, they file an issue, and then the type of the function just gets generalized to something more general. And then the next time the next person comes along, now it's already general, and it'll probably just work. Maybe it needs. Maybe there's a couple of iterations where it's like, oh no, no, it could actually be even more general than we made it. And then eventually you find like the right level, and you're like, oh, okay, I've actually typed this signature to like the exact set of things to which it applies. Yeah. So what if you want to write a function such that Someone calling your function will not get a method error on some internal assumption that they don't even understand. I, that's a problem. Um, I think that's a problem in all languages. You basically have to check uh, that some interface is being implemented. So in languages that have first class interfaces and statically check that they are correctly implemented, you can you can get you can see that okay you you did it you implemented this correctly you're never going to have that problem. Um, we will probably never do static type checking in Julia. I've thought a bit about this, um, and th there's a Go proposal for the Go programming language for um, something that's sort of similar to this, but they want to do static checking. But I actually think for us, it would make sense to do testing. So the notion of an interface is probably saying, look, if you implement this generic type, it has to satisfy these properties, and then be able to generate tests for that. And then you could be have some confidence that, OK, this you've correctly implemented this generic, this abstraction. Um, on the flip side, what you want to be able to do is to take code that uses an abstraction and test that it has used that abstraction correctly. Um, and that can also be done. And there's a couple cases in Julia's test code, Julia's base test test code base that uh, do things like abstract, like generic array and generic string. They're basically just these wrappers that all they do is they 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 call they wrap some you know actual implementation of a string or an array 
but the only methods they expose are the ones that you sort of the bare ones that you need to define in order to have this abstraction. And then if you test your code that to, that it works on those, then you know that you haven't like you haven't violated the abstraction boundary. So I think just formalizing that and making it a thing that you can do automatically would be would be a really huge step in the right direction. Um, but that I mean that same uh, problem exists in like any like in Python or Ruby or something. Um, and and the static languages have a leg up on that because they can check that you know you can't you've you've called a method that isn't guaranteed to exist and the type checker will tell you that that's a no no. Um, all right. So in conclusion. I'm wrapping it up here. Uh, we see unusually large amounts of code reuse and sharing in Julia. There's two varieties, and they're both expanded by multiple dispatch, but different aspects of multiple dispatch. So there's the common types sharing that we see a lot of, and that's just because methods can be added to types after they're defined. Seems super simple, but it's kind of a big deal. Uh, generic algorithms that apply to lots of different types and just work, um, and that's Basically, the idea that you you know because methods are selected based on all of the types of all of the arguments, um, this just works without friction and without like corner cases that fail, which is the unfortunately the situation in a lot of other languages. So that's my argument in a nutshell. All right, thank you. multiple dispatch to people who use C++, they usually tell me, oh, that's something I can do with everything. Um, uh, yeah. Let me know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, OK, I will, I'll repeat it. So uh, the question was that when, um, when C++ programmers are presented with multiple dispatch, their answer is often, I can do that with templates. Uh, and that is. That's a good question. Um, I'm going to see if I can think of an answer off the top of my head, but I'm also going to write down the question because uh, it's a good one, and I want to have a better answer. Yeah, I mean, that's true. You can do anything with templates. Um, I'll write it down right after. But, um, but can you do what you did where you just add a method to yeah, so the thing is you have to plan to template everything. So yes, if you're willing to insert templates everywhere in all of your in every function, in every type, in every mm -hmm. everything in C++, you can, of course, do that. Um, the nice thing in Julia is you, nobody has to plan to do this. You just to find a type and like, okay, cool. People can add methods to it. Um, you didn't have to do anything to anticipate that. Uh, and the same thing with functions. You know, people just define functions, and it's like, well, I didn't anticipate that someone was gonna find a special case of my function that they can implement much more efficiently. So I didn't template it, but someone can just come along and be like, oh, you know, I have like, I have a, I have a really clever way to implement this particular special case of this. And all they have to do is define a method, and boom, it just works. So I think you can do everything with templates. The, uh, the flip side of templates is that, you, that with templates, you have to pre-compile every single possible case that you might ever call. So you know, if people think that Julia has a problem with code generation, which we do, we, we need to work on the latency thing. But at least we're only generating the things you actually use. In C++, you're sitting there waiting for like 45 minutes while it's compiling things that you probably will never use, but might possibly use because you use templates. Um, and also, templates completely sacrifice modularity. So you can't comp compile separate modules. You have to compile your entire program together if you're using templates, essentially. So it, it is another way to, it, there are ways to address it. But it's also, it might be another situation where the, uh, the cure is worse than the ailment. Other questions? Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Okay. It's, uh, it's the Do you want to use this? My laptop or? Do you need the adapter? No, the laptop.
I mean, if you want to, yeah, sure. It might be. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, you can switch to now if you want. No, it's fine. It's just that I. Um, Okay. And I'm already logged in. And you're already logged in, so it's easy. So maybe we should end the stream and then open a new one. So the videos are separate. Up to you. you yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> There were slides.